Hi, right, Jesse. Hey, Logan. Uh, I just want to say I'm a big fan. I, I love the film. Thank you, Jesse. That's a great opening. Yeah. Um, so they're they're more known for horror. Was there any hesitation bringing Blumhouse on board? There was no hesitation at all because Blumhouse has also been making incredible narrative-driven uh, stories for a long time, both in TV and film. Um, and being a part of their family, I was somewhat privy to it. Um, what I didn't know is that Jason Blum and Ethan had a relationship before then with Malapart back in the um, back in the nineties, uh, uh, which was the hot off Broadway theater company that myself and any other uh, young hot start out of an MFA wanted to be a part of. And you're more known for acting, and this is your directorial debut. Um, what provoked your transition to the director's chair? Um, well, nothing provoked it, but um, I was finally kind of nudged out of the nest by my team, who had been hinting at it for a long time. I've got somewhat of a photography background, and um, I come from a family of theater directors, so I was in the blood of directed for the stage before, and I decided finally to put pen to paper because I didn't know how to direct someone else's ideas or visions i'm just not i'm not a good enough director so for now i have to rely on my own eye of the camera when i'm writing which is what i do so when i write i write for the reader with a sense of real imagery and character of course and hopefully some story um but i'm learning on the fly i will continue to learn on the fly as long as i live because I am certainly not the most seasoned writer. But that said, I got a point of view, and I didn't live in the trailer for 20 years as an actor. I, I lived on my mark and secretly shadowed all the departments, including the directing department. So, you know, you mentioned writing, um, and the, the story, it's, it's definitely original. Um, where did you find that inspiration? Well, you know, I wrote a script that demanded a little more financing, and I was told, write something that's a little more feasible. And I was told, though, by a few people, to make sure, a couple producers told me, make sure that when you write something that you get a sexy IP. And make sure that it's dynamic, it's got fun, rock and roll, a little, a little violence, maybe some drugs. Make sure it's not original, okay? And that, to me, turned my stomach, and I went and did the opposite. <laughs> but I also knew, in doing the opposite, I was moving away from my own instincts. As my instincts are fun, action, science fiction, horror. I love those films. This one made me the man I am today. But I also knew that I needed to work on certain human conditional truths if I was going to write something meaningful. So I had to start with myself. And the most dynamic thing about me seven years ago was just simply how lost I was as a father and how frightened and terrified I was at the same time I was dropped dead in love with my little girl who I really become a father almost overnight with. And I wrote the film for her, for my daughter. Yeah, like I, I think that's your answer. I can, I can, yeah, definitely. Uh, I like I have a, a son myself, and uh, watching watching the film ah. a few nights ago, um, we'd we'd literally have to pause the film, gather ourselves, and go again. Everything felt so real. Uh, what do you think attributes to that heightened um, sense of realism? It just it felt like we were watching a slice of life versus like an actual film, ultimately. Well, then, I, then, then I've achieved something, because that's what it is. It is a slice of life. It really is. It is a slice of life. It's not an indictment on any kind of system. It's, it's a story about redemption, purpose, and hope. And... Wait, now I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think like, um, attributes to the heightened sense of realism? 
Oh, right. And so what I believe attributes the most to the heightened sense of realism is that I set out to write something that was, quote-unquote, unfinished. That's a word I pretty much wanted every department to have on any mood board, was unfinished. That's what we are. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're always looking to be finished, us humans, but we're never finished. We're not finished in our thoughts. We're not finished in our sentences, for the most part. We're not finished in our relationships. We're not even finished in most of the things we're trying to achieve. What is finished? And nothing is finished. And so that's what I set out to... Oh, those are the rules I set out to break. I wanted the love interest to um, to be, of course, the baby, but I also wanted the love in another love interest to show up in Act 3. I wanted... I want you to not see her face when she's turning. I want the baby to be taken from his arms at the, at the moment you don't want. I want things unfinished, and on top of it all, I decided with Pepe to strictly and sterilely lock that camera off. I love and that. let the frames be deepened by my production designer, Emma Rose Mead, be deepened by my actor, Ethan Hawke, be deepened by my camera. We, use, we don't use any push. We use a very slow zoom, a very undistinctable zoom that tightens these scenes and, and puts tension in, in, in Russell Earl Millings. And I wanted the audience to be treated as intellectuals who can do their own editing because the performance is there. Yeah. If you don't have the performance, well, you got to go find the performance. But when you have the performance, you get the fuck out of its way and you let it do the, talk, the talking. You know what I mean? And that's who I had in Ethan. Had a great story. How, how close were you to the casting process? So close I could touch it. <laughs> so what was the what was the timeline like as far as like deciding on Ethan or like where where did that decision come into play? Well, it was the first decision. <laughs> I finished it. I thought to myself, well, who is Russell Earl Millings? And I thought, well, it's Ethan Hawke. And then I thought, well, we're not going to get it, Ethan. And then I thought, well, why wouldn't we? Let's just see. And so we sent it to Ethan. About two months later, he read it. He liked it. And he wanted to do it. And then at that stage, we decided to find a house. And I had just finished working with Blumhouse. I knew their ability to tell incredible stories with deep narrative. And I said, why not? And they read it. They turned it around in two hours and said, this is our tender mercies. And I said, that's exactly the film I was trying to make. And the rest is history. Because then we realized Jason and Ethan had their own um, history. And so there was a strong sense of familiarity and that is a great place to jump from when you're trying to make a film, you know. So um, I, I love the film. I love the music. Jason Isbell was was perfect choice. Um, but while I have you on the phone, I would be I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, this is a little out of left field, but oddly enough, I was a fan of a little known show that you were on a few years back. I know it has been a while since the Orange County days. But what was the Trey Atwood experience like? Season two was always my favorite season. <laughs> I was like, all right, which series is he going after? Which <laughs> series that I only did one season of is he going after? Um, it, I mean, I don't really remember my time on, <laughs> on the OC. I was a young um, asshole. And uh, I also was a... Uh, um, was I, I thought my shit didn't stink. I still do. It's a daily <laughs> Um But, you know, the reason I wanted to, to be on the OC was I had a friend on the OC. I had a good friend in Ben. Yeah. And um, it was a no-brainer. Uh, once, once Ben and I spoke, um, I just wanted to act with Ben. I love him. And Ben and I have remained friends and remained very close friends and um if there's anything i take away from the oc having never watched an episode if i'm being honest <laughs> um I, it, 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 it's 
Ben McKenzie, um, one of the closest human beings to me, and um, someone I consider a brother. Excellent. Off and on the screen. Well, Logan, thank you for your time here at Cinedump. We let the doers know how they're doing, and you're doing just fine. Adopt a Highway was was fantastic, and this was a great interview, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm looking forward to doing another interview on my next film. I'll be I'll be there, buddy. All right, my man.